Um, so today I'm going to provide a kind of overview of the very early stages of my dissertation research. Um, my project first emerged out of my interest in textiles, both within a courtly context and in terms of depictions of costume as it related to social and geographic identity in the early modern period. Um, my background previous to this project had been in 16th century and 17th century Italian works on paper, so this is a bit of a hard left turn for me. Um, so I, uh, when I was on a quest of sorts of discovering what I wanted to write my dissertation about, I happened to stumble upon a few different uh, images of scissors um, and just a quick search in some online museum databases quickly helped me realize that this is a really enormous topic, and so I'm, I'm in the rabbit hole now. Um, so what I'm showing you here um, is three different styles of scissors that I'll get to in a minute. So there's almost no literature about scissors from an art historical perspective. The little scholarship that I have been able to find um, tends to be very Anglo-centric and tends to focus on 19th century Victorian metalwork or um, medieval archaeological finds um, and the kinds of images that um, uh, are similar to what you're seeing here on the left, this seventh century pair of scissors now in the Met. What was really interesting to me beyond the variety of the types of scissors um, and their designs was how a study of scissors from a decorative arts perspective relates to many other important topics, such as the widespread use of paper in the early modern period and humanist scholarship marriage rit rituals and gender, court artists and the status of metalworking in art theory, and the more general questions of production, technical issues, and trade. So to begin, I'd like to distinguish between the more utilitarian scissors that were made um, during this period and earlier, and the focus of my project, which I'm calling luxury scissors. Um, so utilitarian scissors have been around since at least 2000 BCE. Um, but luxury scissors, which I would define as um, those made of more costly metals or with elaborate patterning um, or housed in specially made cases, um, those really emerge in 16th century Europe and in the Middle East. And they continue to be made and collected well into the 19th century, both in Europe and east of the Mediterranean. So I'm trying to fill this gap in scholarship by addressing the art history of scissors um, throughout the early modern period. So one common um, type of scissor that I have found um, in collections today would have been used specifically for cutting paper or parchment. So here we are looking at um, several different types of these, or several different images of this type of scissor. These seem to have appeared particularly in Spain, um, the Safavid Empire, and in the Ottoman Empire. Um, there was another image I'll just show briefly in the previous slide. Um, this is in uh, Zollingen in Germany, um, and these um, we think are attributed to uh, Isfahan manufacturer. So um, parchment scissors, particularly like these seen on the right and in the previous slide, were at times given as diplomatic gifts. So we have um, evidence of Ottoman calligraphers sets um, in archival sources and extant collections um, being given as diplomatic gifts. So these scissors would have had gilded inscriptions, geometric patterning. The pair of scissors that you're looking at on the right here um, I think is especially interesting. Um, the way that they close the, the bows where you put your fingers through actually nest on top of each other. Um, so this leads to a more sleek design. This could have been made for a specially um, designed type of case um, or perhaps the sleek design would have made these easier to stow away um, for storage. The images that you're looking uh, at on the left and in the center here are all scissors made in Albacete, Spain, which is a town um, not too far from Madrid. Um, this was a major center of blade making uh, throughout the particularly 17th and 18th century. So we have a pair of more utilitarian scissors um, and then the others have some kinds of etched designs and inscriptions. The pair in the Met has, um, we know the name of the maker because his name is actually etched into the blades themselves. Um, sometimes this style of scissor has been kind of uh, erroneously referred to as dagger scissors. Um, I found some uh, 
just to emphasize this, very unsubstantiated claims that this label was a result of a practice of women in Istanbul who tucked a pair of these scissors in their shoes as a self-defense weapon uh, in the 19th century. Um, I would propose that a maybe more likely or at least equally likely um, reason behind this label is that when they are closed, they do actually just resemble a dagger. So I'd like to focus just for a minute on one, um, one of my favorite pairs of scissors that I've found. Um, these are in the Louvre, and what I love about these is that they really speak to the ways in which um, scissors connect to the arts more broadly. So these are what is referred to as spring scissors, so they operate by pushing the handles together rather than pulling them apart. Um, this really shows how lots of different artists would use ornament prints and could adapt designs to different uses. So the scissor blades themselves here are covered in a damascened pattern with a pattern of masks and grotesques on one side. You can see this in the image on the left. And on the other side, we have an image of armor. I hope you can see it right here. I'm also showing you an ornament print by Daniel Hopfer with fluted designs that would have been intended to be etched on a custom-made breastplate. Um, there was a trend in the early 16th century in fluted armor designs, um, such as the kind that would have been made in Germany, in Nuremberg and Augsburg, for example, um, in which these fluted channels would have etched patterns in them. And um, sometimes you see images of armor on the armor itself. So it's a kind of uh, self-referential image. So this indicates that here the design on these Louvre scissors was almost certainly from a style of ornament print intended for use on armor. And that the artist would have applied this, some, this ornament print to the scissor blades um, because they had a very similar shape. So in addition to the ornament on the outside of the blades, I hope um, you can see here, there is also patterning where the blades meet. And this hasn't worn away. So this suggests that the shears were made carefully enough to ensure that the two blades um, only scraped together where necessary and preserved the design within. This level of detail, along with the recycling of ornament prints and the use of gold damascening for an object for personal or private use, um, brings me to a central issue of my dissertation, um, which is that we should think of luxury scissors as objets de vertu, which are small, personal, prized objects aside from furniture, jewelry, or other decorative arts. So these are very, um, tend to be small objects that are used in more personal, intimate settings. This point is, I think, particularly demonstrated by another type of scissor-related object that I'm finding um, quite a lot of in collections. Uh, these are cases for embroidery scissors. They're very small, um, only a couple inches long in most cases. They fit about in the palm of your hand. Um, and what I'd like to focus on here is the designs of the cases themselves. So we see um, enamel floral cases with some gilding, such as the image on the left. These tend to most frequently be made in the Low Countries and sometimes in France. And then we see many, many steel cases with vegetal motifs and classicizing images that tended to be popular in France, particularly during the 17th century, um, as well as the Low Countries, excuse me. So these were, like I said, um, very prized possessions that would have operated in more intimate domestic spaces. They were also marital gifts um, and could be used for a, a personal hobby such as embroidery. These cases tended to follow a certain typology, which I hope is beginning to be clear here, um, particularly in the instances that are made of metal. So they have vegetal motifs, classicizing patterns, and occasionally inscriptions in vernacular languages, sometimes in Latin as well. The ornament print in the center here by Theodore de Bry is unmistakably similar to the extant case on the right, suggesting that there was an active demand for cases for embroidery scissors at the time. The printed design contains acanthus leaves, a grotesque, and cornucopia to symbolize abundance, and a woven pattern that might refer to embroidery itself or the textile arts more generally. But there might be another deeper meaning behind this knotted motif, and I'm referring to the um, portion at the bottom. 
So in ancient Rome, there was a practice of a special knot um, that was worn around a woman's belt. And as part of the um, marriage ceremonies, the groom would ceremonially uh, untie this belt. This led to our phrase, uh, tying the knot today. Um, and so this suggests a really strong association between images of knots and marriage rituals. The symbolism found in the Debray image then makes perfect sense for a marriage gift. The horizontal band in the center could have decoration as you see here, or the aforementioned type of inscription. Debray has provided a wide array of symbolic images in the single ornament print, which artists could then adapt to their own designs for scissor cases. The practice of a man uh, giving a decorative scissor case to a woman as a marriage gift is supported by um, extant objects themselves and their iconography. So here we are looking at an object that is in the Met. Um, it has an inscription in French, which is a pun that uh, hinges around the word lien. This means a connection, a link, or a rapport, but it can also reference um, the practice of spinning thread on a wheel. So it doubly references textiles themselves. The complexity of the iconography of these cases might suggest that the market for these objects was a fairly learned one, particularly in instances of more complex classicizing images and Latin inscriptions. A final um, important aspect of this case is that it has tiny holes on either side. This would have allowed the owner to use a piece of string to wear the scissors around her neck like a necklace or on a belt. This practice is well documented by printed images that show um, exactly this. So here we're looking at a 17th century print and you can see that this woman has a pair of scissors on her belt. So I think this somewhat resists the idea of luxury scissors as objet de vertu. Um, if we consider the practice of wearing scissors on the body, not unlike a piece of jewelry, they become more akin to a fashion accessory. So perhaps they were actually intended to be seen in public spaces after all. A major question I had at the outset of my research was why scissors in particular became such a pop popular marriage gift. Um, on a basic level, of course, they are useful for embroidery, which was a popular hobby among upper class women in the early modern period. And importantly, um, among the emerging middle, uh, middle class or merchant class, which is a social phenomenon that has received extensive scholarly attention, particularly in the low countries in the 17th century. A decorative pair of scissors was then indeed a luxurious object, but a small scale steel case, like we saw in the previous slide, for example, would have been affordable to an increasingly affluent population. This might explain why these objects in modern collections seem to trace largely to the 17th century and later periods, whereas their appearance in the 16th century is more rare. In addition to the implications surrounding these social hierarchies, scissors themselves apparently had a symbolic meaning in terms of marriage. Uh, this is supported by writings during the 18th and 19th century um, when people noted that scissors were like a married couple. So Sidney Smith, who was the, an English cleric uh, and writer working in the late 18th and early 19th century, once said, quote, did you ever hear my definition of marriage? It is that it resembles a pair of shears, so joined that they cannot be separated often moving in opposite directions, yet always punishing anyone who comes between them." End quote. <laughs> um, Benjamin Franklin and the English poet Richard Jago also expressed similar sentiments, which I'm showing you here. So these ideas are from a somewhat later period than what I am working on in my dissertation, but I'm interested as to whether this symbolic association between scissors and marriage was alive and well in earlier centuries too. This would seem to suggest that scissors could simultaneously be statements of fidelity through their inscriptions, um, the emblematic idea of marriage itself as a partnership, and potentially they were usable tools for the recipient of these gifts. So while decorative scissors might have been affordable to a larger population in the 17th century, they do also appear in a courtly context throughout the early modern period. 
Um, as I previously mentioned, they were sometimes a part of a calligrapher's set given as a diplomatic gift in the Ottoman Empire. In Italy, we have surviving correspondence that tells us that an agent of Cosimo de' Medici wrote to order him a pair of nail scissors which to, were to be garnished with gilding. Apparently, while Cosimo was traveling outside of Florence, he found himself in desperate need of such an object. This tells us that these scissors were actually intended to be used rather than simply admired, and that, at least for Cosimo, it was vital that even nail clippers had some sort of decorative element. In other words, a decorative object could be both a work of art and a usable tool. So here, uh, Wenzel Jamnitzer was a court artist in the Holy Roman Empire in the 16th century. He's one of the most uh, well-known goldsmiths at the time as well. He made this silver writing box, which is recorded in the Kunstkammer at Schloss Ambras. While the case itself has received extensive scholarly attention uh, because he cast these animals from life, um, the tools themselves have received almost no attention. If anything, I would argue that they speak to the remarkable skill of Jamnitzer. The technical complexity of making a pair of scissors is very, very specific, um, particularly in terms of a riveted pair like this. Um, and I would argue that this really attests to the breadth of his skills as a uh, silversmith and goldsmith. There was apparently a demand for gilded tools in princely settings, and this also allowed Jamnitzer to show off his technical virtuosity, and um, particularly because this is displayed in the Kunstkammer, which was the semi-private uh, space of political power. This again speaks to the idea that luxury scissors in ornate cases were meant to be seen, albeit by an extremely privileged audience in the Kunstkammer. This again uh, resists the idea that scissors were merely tools or that they were restricted to intimate spaces. Rather, they were meant to be used and to be seen. As the production of decorative scissors continued well into the 19th century, there are a few, scissor, uh, a few cities that emerge as centers of scissor production. Um, these are Sheffield, England, Zollingen, Germany, Albacete, Spain, Thiers in France, uh, among other, other larger cities like Milan, London, Paris, etc. So um, the fact that this reputation was essential to these cities is especially clear in um, the material displayed at World's Fairs. So here we're looking at three examples of exhibition scissors. On the left and in the center, we see scissors made in Sheffield. These are um, both housed in the Millennium Gallery in Sheffield today. And on the right is a pair made in Solingen. These were giant. I have a slightly unflattering picture of myself here to show the scale. Um, but they're sometimes up to two, over two feet in, um, in length. So they're certainly not meant to be used. They're meant to be seen. Um, they are primarily made of steel, but sometimes they have gilding or silver, especially on these decorative handles, as well as etched patterns on the blades. Although these exhibition scissors um, are extremely different from their 16th century counterparts. Luxury scissors in the 19th century were thus associated with fine craftsmanship, um, the steel industry, local histories, and workshops. These scissors are a far cry from the Frankish scissors that this presentation began with, um, but they reveal the artistic ingenuity that became a point of pride for these cities by the mid-19th century. Um, so in the future, I hope that this dissertation will um, more clearly reveal how these objects came to be and the important place that luxury scissors had in the early modern world. Thank you. Thank you.